being on. All right, everybody, let's get started. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Terrence Lackeran, AKA the Optical Poet, and I'm the Director of Partnerships and Programming with the Vision Council. And on behalf of the Vision Council and Vision Expo shows, I wanna welcome everybody to Coffee Talk. Hopefully you brought your hot or cold beverage of choice, because we're gonna go deep today. Uh, there are just a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, as you can see, uh, we chose to use the platform Zoom. And the reason why we chose to use Zoom is because what you see right here, you can see each other, you can uh, see faces and see people that you know and type in the chat box. We felt that Zoom gave a really nice community feel, especially because a lot of us haven't been together in over a year. Uh, but in order for this to truly work, uh, it's very important that unless you are a speaker, to keep your microphones on mute. Please keep your microphones on mute so it does not disrupt the speakers as well. Now, just in case for any reason we get disconnected or, for, or we start having any trouble, please just log out and log back in in five minutes. Now, if after five minutes we are not back on, we will send you an email letting you know another date and time that's been chosen for this talk as well. Uh, now, questions, we love questions. We, we may not be able to get to questions uh, today, time permitting, but we can still see your questions in the chat box. If you have any questions for the panelists, go ahead and chat them in the box as well. So, all right, so now that my, call, my uh, housekeeping speech is done, again, I wanna welcome everybody to Coffee Talk. As we know, if you've attended Coffee Talk, this is our 13th Coffee Talk we've done. Every week we do these. Uh, and uh, we usually are dealing with topics of business and rev direct revenue generating uh, um, strategies and things to keep business going during COVID. Uh, but today we're pivoting. Uh, we're pivoting to a subject that's a much needed discussion within our industry. Uh, we actually had this discussion uh, going to be planned for the end of the summer, with Dr. Richardson and I, but with the current world events, uh, we decided to pivot and, and move this discussion up. But I'm Dr. Richardson, I really want to thank you for uh, being flexible and getting this together on such short notice. Uh, we think about the issues of diversity, inclusion, and, it's, uh, and equity, and it's something that this industry uh, is definitely uh, uh, needing some improvement, quite a bit of improvement. So these panelists today are going to talk about their experiences. So I want to turn this discussion over to an optometrist who is also known for her mixture of wellness and optometry and a good friend of mine. Dr. Richardson, what's going on? Hey guys, good morning. My name is Dr. Danielle Richardson. I am a Los Angeles-based optometrist. I practice at Zap. And welcome to today's Coffee Talk. Like Terrence said, we had this conversation on diversity and inclusion already pre-planned, but given the unfolding of current events, we have to rise to meet the moment, and so we've pivoted and changed the conversation a bit. So typically when we talk about diversity and inclusion, we really keep things very surface level. We bring up studies and research and we talk about why it's good or why we should be considering it. Today, we're gonna drop the surface level conversation and we're gonna have a real and honest conversation. So the goal here today is to not only discuss the experience of race within our industry amongst multiple types of professionals, but it's also to discuss what true allyship and support looks like to us. As you've noticed, or maybe as you've been aware of, this is a time of racial reckoning in this country. So really this moment is about who we are as people and what we really believe in and what we stand for. So my goal today is for you guys as attendees to learn, to listen, and to hopefully walk away feeling empowered to actually be a true ally and support creating a more diverse and inclusive optical environment. I have amazing panelists joining me for today's conversation, so I'll have them introduce themselves. And we'll go ahead and start with you, Dr. Reynolds, if you could give us a quick introduction. Your name, where you're from, and your role within the optical industry. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and be invited as a panelist. My name is Dr. Cheryl Reynolds, and I'm a 1996 graduate of Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry. Uh, the wonderful Dr. Howard Purcell, who's on this line, was my instructor, but I know I look so young, 25 looking. But anyway, I graduated from Nova Southeastern. 
I did a residency um, after completion of my degree and I had a private practice. And after about three, four years, I had some great mentors, um, mostly men and women of the NOA and Dr. Terrence Ingraham, who was one of my mentors, one of my friends, and she's a giant in the field of optometry, uh, really uh, encouraged me based on the fact that there weren't that many uh, minorities uh, on faculty at schools and college of optometry to join the ranks at Nova Southeastern University. And I've been there over 20 years and it's been a wonderful experience to be part of educating the students and graduating the next generation of optometrists. My role right now, the reason I, I think this is important is I'm currently the president of the National Optometric Association. So really quickly, I just wanna give a background because I constantly hear what is the NOA. I'm also an AOA member, a proud AOA member. I'm also an FOA member because I live in Florida. But the NOA started in 1969 was because of what's going right now on right now, the climate of racial injustice, hatred, and bigotry. And it wasn't that the doctors uh, that started the NOA, Dr. C. Clayton Powell, and the late Dr. John Howlett, and the 25 other brave black minority doctors uh, in Richmond, Virginia, didn't go to optometry school. They just didn't feel inclusive in the profession as a whole. When we talk about the optical industry, you, you can't help but talk about optometrists, right? Because we're part of that, a big part of that. And they didn't feel inclusive. So they wanted their voice to be heard. Uh, as Dr. Powell says, taxation without representation, we could join the AOA. And at that time in the 60s, you couldn't go to certain venues where the AOA was held. It was in the South. It was a very, uh, uh, very tense time in America. And so the AOA was born out of that need to increase diversity. But let me tell you, it's not just diversity, it's inclusion. You can have a diverse work field, but if you don't have inclusion, what's the point? And most importantly, equality you know, equity for all the employees, equity for all the doctors, having the opportunity to be on the stage. And because of their hard work, determination, they also led to developing more and having more uh, African-American optometrists in underserved communities. As you know, we disproportionately are impacted from eye disease, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. We're the ones that go blind, uh, minority patients. So uh, that was one of the benefits of the organization starting. We had more doctors in underserved areas. Over the years, it's been 50 years or more. I just want to mention that the numbers still haven't moved when we talk about optometry school. We also formed our NOSA chapter, which stands for the National Optometric Student Association to encourage our schools and colleges of optometry to become more diverse, more inclusive, and more representative of the patient population. And those challenges are still today, 2020. So we have a lot of work to do. So I'm really excited to be part of this panel to discuss how we can move the needle forward, especially in the optometric community, the eye care profession, and the optical industry. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Reynolds. Coco and Breezy, would you guys like to introduce yourselves next? Sure, I'm Coco. And I'm Breezy. And we are the founders of Coco and Breezy Eyewear. Um, we're super excited to be here. Uh, we are one out of maybe less than five eyewear companies that are founded by Black women. We were, Terrence told me we were the first um, Black-owned company to have a booth at Vision Expo, which is a really big issue, actually. So I think that, um, that's a big issue. I don't want to be the first. I don't want to be the only. And, and I would say we were the first women found black women founded company and founders to be the faces of 2020 magazine as well. And that's an, another um, big issue. And so our goal is to use our platform and our voices to um, make change. And if anyone knows us, we have been talking about inclusion since we first started in the industry. And we always, anyone that knows us, we've always talked about those things. And I'm so happy that now we can finally talk about it more where people can start understanding, but um, I can't wait to share our story and we're excited to be here. And I think our, our goal is to really um, kind of like give the awareness that since we are the only, we don't want to be the only, but why it is so important for us to show black and brown people in our campaigns because we've gotten a lot of requests. We'll talk about that later. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but again, <laughs> our goal is to like show people that why it's so important to show that. Because if, if you think about it, if we are the only company who are founded by that and telling that story, the goal is to uh, teach people to unlearn advertisement 
and for non-Black people to shop the way we shop is that we shop every day not seeing our faces. And so we want to make everyone else comfortable to shop mm -hmm. with the Black story because we do this on an everyday basis. So we're happy to be here. I think the IRA industry is extremely behind. And so I'm pumped to, um, to share that side of our story. Thank you guys so much. Um, Dr. Purcell, would you like to introduce yourself next? <laughs> it would be my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. And I, it's a real honor to be on here with you. Thank you to Terrence. Uh, thank you to the Vision Council. I see uh, Ashley Mills there does a wonderful job of running the Vision Council. I was uh, honored to be part of their organization for a period of time and enjoyed every minute of that. They continue to do a great job of supporting our profession and of uh, providing great education. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm also honored to be with some people who I tremendously admire. I've had the pleasure of working with Sherry Ann uh, during my time at Essilor. Uh, Talk about it. I know Coco and Breezy were mentioning about uh, using people of color and black and brown people in advertisements, et cetera. Sherry Ann has done, in my opinion, probably the best job in the industry of making sure that those things continue to happen and of educating all of us on that. So I salute her for that. I've had the pleasure of also getting to know Dr. Reynolds. Uh, she was a student of mine, she mentioned. And the other thing we have in common, Dr. Reynolds and I, is that uh, Terry Ingram was someone who really influenced our lives in a very big way. And finally, I'll just say, Coco and Breezy, you guys have added so much flair and style and enthusiasm to this industry from the first time I met you guys. So couldn't be any happier to be on with all of you. Uh, my story is perhaps a little bit different than the rest of you, as is probably obvious. Um, however, I've had some incredible influences in my career that have really helped me to better understand, helped me to walk in the shoes of other people and really understand it better. Uh, my background grew up, uh, well, I graduated from New England College of Optometry. I'm a second gen graduate of the college. My father went there back in the 50s and I went there in the 80s, yikes. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I, my career started there. I went back and joined my father's practice um, and then spent about 25 years in industry uh, and really learned a lot about the issues that we're talking about today in my industry experience, both candidly the upsides and the downsides, but I went to public school. I grew up in Miami Beach where 15 years before I went to school, black people could not be on Miami Beach after dark. I, I lived through high school of busing um, where there were race riots in my high school where motorcycle cops riding through the hallways. So although I may not have had the same experience, I sure, certainly have not. I've had enough experience to appreciate the importance of the topic at hand here. And one thing I can commit to you is that New England College of Optometry is focused on this issue. It is critically important to us. And I believe, honestly, it all starts at the schools and colleges. If we want to see more black and brown faces in this industry, then we all have to work together. I know the NOA is doing a wonderful job at this, but we have to continue to push and to hold us all accountable for looking at mm -hmm. how we bring more people of color, black and brown people into this industry. And I really believe the schools and colleges are at the heart of it because it's where it starts. And I look forward to having mm -hmm. some form, formal, more formal dialogue with you all about it. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be on with you. Thank you very much, Danielle. Absolutely, thank you so much. And last but not least, Sherry Ann, could you introduce yourself? Sure, so I'm Sherry Ann James and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Essilor of America as well as the Senior Vice President of Customer Engagement. And I started my career in optical actually with Transitions, which is where we parlayed a relationship with Coco and Breezy, as I said earlier, to a smaller group of you guys. And I think in terms of my feelings on the, the issue, um, they're very uniquely impacted by the fact that I actually wasn't raised here. So I actually have lived here, I think, 25 something years, I have to check, but um, I was born in England and I grew up in the islands, specifically Trinidad and Tobago. And as I, as we go through and you do some of the specific questions, I'll talk about specifically how that impacts me. But I think we're um, at a, a 30,000 foot level. The thing that's most um, alarming to me still is how far I keep thinking that we're getting and then how many steps we seem to sometimes take back because growing up in a reality where I'm not saying it was perfect, but we certainly didn't have the, the fear of life, fear of driving, fear of all the things that, that are starting to become more apparent. You know, you, you, my child was born around the same time that Barack Obama was president and, and forgive me for the naivete, but I was like, okay, so things are now gonna get to kind of like the way they were in Trinidad. Well, obviously that's not exactly what happened. So I, I think for me, the discovery of the work that we need to put in, and I love this terminology 
that's coming to bear of allies, people of like mind who just want to um, really figure out what should I be doing differently? I think that's something that I'm seeing as an amazing pivot in the conversation now, because previously a conversation like this would only exist uh, with black people for black people. And for the first time I'm seeing this conversation become one of an American conversation and everybody wanting to understand in their own way so that they can be, be a representation of what they think this country really is meant. Absolutely, thank you so much. And um, to continue speaking specifically about the terminology, I just wanna define a couple of these terms for everyone on the call. Maybe some people have more familiarity with the terms diversity and inclusion and ally than others. So diversity in its simplest terms is just traits or characteristics that make people unique. Inclusion in its simplest terms are behaviors and social norms that ensure people feel welcome. An ally in its simplest term is one that is associated with another as a helper. So again, the conversation, kind of like I was saying in the introduction, it has evolved because not only do we want to talk on uh, just the high level diversity and inclusion points, but today we're actually going to go into personal experience to create a level of understanding about what is the reality that has been happening within the optical industry. So my first question that I pose to all of the panelists, I asked if they could share um, an experience that they have had, um, share an experience where race affected either their personal or professional life. And that question was kept purposely broad because as you've heard from introductions, we come from all sectors of the industry. So everyone's experience is going to be different, both what they experience in this industry and their life experience leading up until this moment right here, right now. So I'll go ahead and open the floor for sharing. If anyone would like to go first, go ahead. And if not, I'll kind of round robin style call on you guys. Well, I want to go first. <laughs> Dr. Purcell. Um, so basically, as in um, my first experience, so as Sherry Ann said, I'm originally from Jamaica. So I left Jamaica when I was four. And my first experience with racism was being through a, a rock thrown at me to get out the neighborhood. We had moved into an all-white neighborhood and it said, the person said, get out, nigger. And I was five. I can't even remember. I was like my mom. I ran home and, and that was my first experience. And throughout my life and throughout my young adult life, um, you know, that one experience resonated. So for me being in optometry school, the biggest impact, was, and it brought it all back up, was patience. And it's happened more than once. Uh, who don't want you to be their eye doctor. So I've had patients say to me that, oh, you're the doctor? Oh, well, I, I, no, I don't want you people uh, to examine me. Now, you people is what coded words. You know, I could have been a Muslim. I could have been Asian. I could be anything. It could be a woman. <laughs> so um, I personally felt that that was a situation where it was the color of my skin. And the first one it happened, I cried like a baby. And one of the things that I want to compliment Nova Southeastern, it was Southeastern at the time, was that patient was escorted out of the clinic. So my experience with that is that they supported me. Um, and in my own practice, when I had my practice, um, I had that happen again. I've had it happen multiple times. And again, these are shocking experiences. You never think that. You just think yourself as an optometrist, that there are some factors that some people just don't like. The color of your skin, the fact that you're female, you're African-American female, I don't know what it is. So those are things that have personally impacted me. And as we're going through the current times, I'm really proud of what Sherry Ann said about the fact that it's such a diverse group of individuals out there just saying that Black Lives Matter because it does matter. However, I've had a NOSA conversation with some of my National Optometric Student Association, and it's, it's, it was really great. It was a, an important meeting for me to have with them because some of them, you know, it's good to share that experience. They may or may not have had that experience because it's not so much, I don't want you people anymore. It's like, okay, I'll just reschedule my exam or I'll see someone else. And uh, so those experiences for me just brings back all those memories of I experienced that and now with the current climate, 
I think about my experience and I'm, I'm happy I could share with my students, but we're in 2020. I have two young kids at home. My daughter is 19, my son is 17. And the conversation with my son is he is different, unfortunately. And that's not I care, but the fact that he is different and he has to be a little bit more conscientious. Uh, you know, he has to have his phone on at all times. And for my daughter who's at UCF, who I'm hoping to be an optometrist, uh, that there are some challenges that she will have to face. So those are my personal experience of uh, being uh, told who I was and how did it affect me? It made me stronger. It made me more determined. These things will happen. And you have to be, uh, have thick skin a little bit. For, like I said, the first time I cried, but I got thick skin after. I would love to share our experience. Um, Coco and I grew up in Minnesota. Um, we actually used to go to this the store, the Cup Foods that right the same store that George Floyd got lynched. We used to go that that was our childhood favorite like store to go get snacks. So we growing up in Minnesota, what's going on right now? It, we noticed that we had to unpack a lot because we were so numb to racism and we were so used to it. It was normalized to us, but we grew up seeing police brutality. The school that we grew up, they were Confederate flags. People used to write on the bathrooms. I hate the N word. And um, until then, I think something that I realized, and I kind of unpacked this throughout this whole situation, is that a lot of times you all you all might hear that when we go into certain situations, we always say, "Oh, it's because I'm black." And I always noticed that a lot of my non-black friends will always say that, "Oh, black people always use the black card," and they blame it on their blackness. But as you can see. It is because of the color of our skin, why we are going through these instances and why we are being judged. It's from the systemic racism. And with us being in the eyewear industry, we faced a lot of different things, even walking on the floor of the Vision Expo. We are not taking away from the people that do support us, but I think that some of the support also comes with microaggressions as well. And so someone may think that they can be an, an ally, but then they're questioning why is it so important to you to have, to show black and brown people? And if you look around Vision Expo and you look around all these other brands, we're and, like- And publications. And publications, we stick out like a sore thumb. And so that's why it's important. Or if you, tell, if you have someone telling you that you can only go national, or you can only be really big if you don't show only black and brown people. But again, what our goal is, is like hearing those things that really hurt our feelings but it also made us stronger to use our voice because we see there's such a lack of diversity. And there's a lack of education because we can say, you know, let's be more diverse, but it takes everyone in this industry to start digging deeper and really understanding the systemic issues that are happening. And we've had so many times where we've cried where, yes, there are a few, there's a lot of stories that are like, we're, we're so happy that you guys are finally, you know, showing black and brown people. But I've had people from our own team say like, there's a store that says that your brand is too black. They love your glasses, but your brand is too black. Because you're showing black, you're showing and, black brown and brown people. people. And I'm like, how can, how can a brand be too black? If you go into, if you look at most of these publications, and if you go into most of the eye care practices where brands are providing marketing material, it's all white. So it's our duty. We even had to someone tell us, um, in order for you guys to go national, you need to show more white people in your campaigns because I want you to go national. How can we not go national if we are showing black and brown people? Just because we want to like re-educate people that even though you see black and brown people, you might see a full campaign that has Asian people in it. If you're white, you can still buy it because we've been, I've been buying hair products that had someone that was white with blonde hair my whole life. So I think people need to re-change and reshift the way they think and the way they approach. And so um, being in this industry, it hurts. It makes my stomach hurt and it makes me cry when I go to a publication, when I go into a store, when someone tells us that um, you guys need to show more white people when you know we're like one of the only people in this space by ourselves. Like we've cried so many times, it's so insensitive. And I think that anyone that's in here, if you're looking at your publication and you're scrolling through each page, and it's all white people and you there's no uncomfortable you should feel so uncomfortable and your stomach should hurt like that is an issue if you're not showing if you're not showing any black or brown people that should make you feel like i shouldn't put anything out right now especially during this time everyone like if you're posting on social media i don't care what your rules are we're in a revolution right now 
And just because you have whatever your magazine is or whatever your product and campaign is that a brand sent you, we're in a moment where there's a lot of representation that has not been shown. So make a pause on what you're posting if it's not taking action. Absolutely. I think that that's so valuable, the point of actively understanding the moment that we are in. And to, or to Sherri Ann's point earlier, what is different about these conversations now is it's no longer a conversation that's just happening in the Black community. This is now an American conversation that is happening everywhere. So at this moment, you are sort of required to draw a line in the sand. Which side are you on? Are you on a world like a more equitable and just side? Are you about creating life, liberty, <laughs> and the pursuit of happiness for all? Or are you about something different and keeping things where you're comfortable or keeping things in your comfort zone? So um, I think that is such a valuable point about meeting the moment and actually being actively engaged. Um, Sherri Ann, could you go ahead and share your experience? I know it's a little bit different since you didn't grow up here in the U.S. Yeah, I think I think what's been very interesting is is mothering in this environment. My my daughter is going to turn fourteen this year, and I I grew up in my sort of naive, happy splendor. Um, probably like a lot of people who are not minorities grow up, where you're just not constantly thinking about your race all the time, which is what this country sort of forces. So what's been interesting in in mothering is to see that I think that my daughter and I are like, because that most moms kind of like, you think you're, you're the same. And then I see how she reacts to things or how she responds to things. And it's, it's her reality is so different from mine. So to get really specific, um, unsurprisingly given um, how chatty I am, my, my daughter is also very chatty and very opinionated. And you know, she, the, the apple doesn't fall, fall far from the tree. So she, Barry got out in front of this George Floyd issue. She had a lot to say. She put it out on social media. You can't control these kids even if you want to. <laughs> she started getting some content in her DMs that was horrific to me. And like, I wanted to go, you know, I'm a mom. So I wanted to go to the mayor, to everywhere. And she was so, the best word for it. She, she was just so explain, mom, this is how they talk in school. Like they, they use the N word at school all the time. And the, the more she said to me, the more I was just being shocked out of my system because I, I went from college into corporate America. So that was my life in the States. And even um, at that time, there was a certain um, decorum that's expected. So who knows what people were saying about me in, in their homes and in their private life. But sort of going from that sheltered college to corporate America, I, I never had anybody say that to me. And to have my daughter just say, no, people talk like that at school all the time. This one says the N-word, because then I started asking her who. So I don't know what I thought I was gonna do, but I'm going through her Instagram. Which one said the N-word? I'm gonna write their mother. It, it wasn't gonna work because I would have been writing hundreds of people's mothers. And so so just the reality that that's what she has to deal with is is overwhelming to me. And it's so unfair to me. And I don't even know how to protect her because I have nothing to draw from um, other than to just put one foot in front of the other. And, and I guess I'll say one more thing that, that Coco and Breezy said that I think is, is something worth understanding. I think you become numb and desensitized because you have to. I, I say it slightly differently. I have a lot of scar tissue and, and one of the most difficult things about what's happening right now is it's it's very um, it's like an emotional roller coaster because you're used to just saying push it down push it down this is just the way it is just deal with it you know you're accomplished you have all your Maslowian needs met you have a great house you have a great home you have a great family you can't think about these things and now we're all being forced to address it but that means that you're being forced to address it you're being forced to wonder what your neighbors are thinking and wonder what they're doing. And, and it, it's just a very raw time um, to, to just figure out what is in your circle of control and, and what can you really make a difference on. Absolutely, I, it, it is. And it's a time where everyone sort of has to make that determination from, for themselves. And I think that's kind of the power of these conversations is that maybe people who haven't confronted these issues or haven't, have, have been repressing them, they now we are having the 
opportunity to have these conversations out in the open and have a dialogue. Um, Dr. Purcell, if you want to go ahead and share your experience. Sure, and obviously my experience is a bit different, but I do want to comment on something Coco and Breezy said because just listening to you tell your story makes my stomach nauseous, to be honest with you. And I have heard over and over, particularly over these past several weeks, so many stories that are horrifying to me. And I, and I salute you, Danielle, and I salute the Optical Poet and our Vision Council for creating opportunities for us to hear more of these stories, because I do think they are critically important for us to hear. They're horrifying in so many different ways, but I think particularly people like me need to hear those stories more. Again, my story is different, but perhaps there's lessons to be learned. And I'll just share briefly. I mentioned I grew up in South Florida, uh, went to high school during busing, um, riots in the hallways of my high school. I didn't even know what was going on. I didn't even know why we were rioting. I didn't know why we were fighting each other. I didn't know, you know, I played football and, you know, I would get, got along with most people. And yet there was this sense that the white people had to stand on this side and the black people had to stand on this side and somehow we were against each other. And the upside of that was we learned to work through it. We learned to figure out how to understand each other a little bit better, bit better. And having that influence in high school was critically important to me as I moved through my career. And we both, uh, both Cheryl and I have mentioned Terry Ingram. And I want to tell a quick story about Terry because it was one of those horrifying stories to listen to and one that had a huge impact on me. So this gentleman we've spoken about a couple of times, Terry Ingram was the first graduate of the University of Alabama Birmingham School of Optometry, first black graduate, I should say. As you can imagine, in Birmingham, Alabama, back then, it wasn't an easy thing for an African-American, for a person of color, to get through. And he told me many stories, uh, but I remember this one vividly, walking through the hallways of an AOA meeting and seeing people come up to us, Terry and I. At this point in time, Terry was an executive at Johnson & Johnson, so he wielded a nice credit card. He had a lot of money that he could spend and help support people. And so as we'd be walking down the hallway, people would be walking the other way and they'd wave to him. Hey, Terry, how you doing, man? It's great to see you. Can you support this? Can you do this? Can you help me out? And as soon as they would pass us, he would say to me in my ear, see that guy right there? That person wouldn't even talk to me in optometry school. Wouldn't even let me see the old tests. Wouldn't even let me come in the room where they were studying. How dare they? I mean, they think I'm stupid. They think I don't remember. They think these things just that you can do it and have no repercussions of it. That really stuck with me because I hadn't seen that experience before. I didn't really know some of the things that many of you were dealing with. I mean, I've seen it. It's not like I'm blind to it, but I think it's critically important. We hear as many of your stories as we possibly can. It brings it to life. These are people we care about and love. And I think it has a huge impact as it did for me on all of us to hear the stories that each of you have gone through to understand it. And I hope that the Vision Council and in Coffee Talk, you'll do more of allowing people to tell their stories. If I could real quick, uh, Black Eye Care Perspective is a wonderful group that I think some of your friends, Adam and Daryl lead, and they did a wonderful video if you have a chance to view it, where it does go through several people telling their story. Incredibly impactful to me to listen to that. And I hope uh, many of you, particularly those of you who happen to not be Black, We'll watch it, we'll listen to it and understand it. It will, it will impact you. Unless you have no uh, sensitivity whatsoever, it will impact you and it impacted me. And I encourage everybody to listen to as many of those stories as they possibly can. Hopefully my little story is helpful to people who maybe haven't walked in the shoes of a person of color and had to deal with those things, but at least experienced it through people they care a great deal about. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that um, about the video that uh, Black Eye Care Perspectives led by Dr. Adam Ramsey and Dr. Daryl Glover. They put together a video with Black um, eye care professionals sort of sharing our experience of race in America. And I actually have a video there. Um, I am from Indianapolis, Indiana. I grew up in Indiana. And despite having a very sheltered, um, comfortable upbringing, again, America forces you to confront race. The first time I was called a racial slur, I was like 10 years old in some random hick town in Indiana. And, you know, it similarly is like the first time somebody calls you that word, especially as a child and it's an adult man calling you that, I think it does create a level of like scaredness and a level of fear. And I remember, you know, I remember hiding in the car on the way home and like being so fearful that the clan was going to come after me and like 
I don't know many other races where a 10 year old is concerned about the Ku Klux Klan coming after them, you know what I mean? And so I think when you think about race consciousness in America, you have to understand that black people in particular have had to be conscious of race our whole life. I consider myself blessed because I have grown up in a family where black pride was non-negotiable. My parents taught me not only is being black beautiful, being black is a blessing and it is something that we should always carry like a badge of honor. So um, throughout my experiences in Indiana and in college, I was always one of the only black people, but I always took it as my, um, I always took it as, as a role of the bridge, right? I was a cheerleader in college and I made everyone sit down and listen to Black History Month presentations. <laughs> and when I was in optometry school, I was the, pres the national president of the National Optometric Association. My stance on it is, is my personal responsibility is to not use my privilege or my access just for myself, but to use that to sort of shine a light on what is really happening and, and to get people on our team, right? So we've talked about allyship and allyship was a conversation that was really left for um, small social, was really left to like the social justice sphere. And it was not something that was kind of at the top of public consciousness. Now, again, after the murder of George Floyd, we have now seen the level of awareness of race consciousness come to the forefront of the American mind. So when you talk about Black Lives Matter now, remember just a few years ago, Black Lives Matter was extremely polarizing and anytime someone heard Black Lives Matter, what was the retort? All lives matter, right? Coming from a defensive place and not even hearing the argument. Now in just a few years and even just a few short weeks, we've made the leap from fringe idea, radical thought that Black people's lives should matter to understanding the fundamental humanity of Black people. So that change has happened not by Black people themselves, but because non-Black people have sort of heard this rallying cry and have under and understand that this moment requires us all to sort of come together in support, particularly of the humanity of Black lives. So when we talk about allyship, when we talk about supporting Black people, when we talk about supporting racial justice and racial equity, one thing that has to be understood is this is not a passive act. It is not something that just happens once, once a blue moon. From this moment on, you can be of support. And so similar to how we shared our experiences of race and racism in America, what I would like all of the panelists to do is share what allyship and support looks like to them. So what does it look like in their segment of the industry? What does it look like through their eyes? And my goal in doing this is to get you to understand that allyship is going to take different forms. But it's, you know, I saw an analogy on social media it's like a road trip, right? Somebody has to drive the car, somebody has to pack the snacks, somebody has to navigate, somebody needs to take care of the kids, somebody has to be the mechanic to make sure the car is running, right? We're all on this road to racial justice and racial equity, but everybody has to be in support of the mission. So um, when we talk about allyship, I want you to always understand it is not the role of Black people to educate you. That is something that you, as an adult, it is your responsibility responsibility to educate yourself. But in this particular forum, I want to share just to give some ideas and to let us uh, kind of explore the differences in what allyship can look like uh, within different sectors of this op optometric industry and what are actionable steps that we can take right now today. So does anybody, would, would anyone love to go first or should I, should we do a round robin style? I'm happy to go first if you'd like. Absolutely. Go ahead. So, uh, Danielle, you did a nice job of defining allyship. And I have to admit, although I knew what the word ally meant, uh, and knowing you were going to ask this question and trying to be as prepared as I could, I did look up allyship. So perhaps if I may add a little bit to the definition you provided, because it was helpful to absolutely. me. Building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability. Those are three pretty big words, and I think very relevant to the discussions we're having. Taking on the struggles as if they're your own. So if I think about it through that filter, if I think about allyship through that filter, then I, I have to focus very much on what my ability is and how I can change things. 
And I would suggest to you, it all starts at the schools and colleges. If we are going to see increased numbers of optometrists who are black or brown, who are gonna be in roles in this profession, they don't just pop up out of the air. They have to come through our academic programs. So being a bit selfish in the world that I live in today, we must do a better job of assuring that we have a welcoming environment for black and brown people in optometry. It starts there. If we don't have that, because we have students coming into our institutions who look around and say, I don't really see a lot of people who look like me. Is this really the right profession for me? And I'm not gonna have faculty members who are people of color, black and brown, if I don't have students who are. So to me, what I would love to see happen is optometry sets the example by which all other professions are going to follow that we make a concerted effort as a profession to change things and to change them dramatically. And each and every person on this call can play a role. Find a person of color if you're not, a black and brown person. Talk to them about the profession of optometry. I believe we can get the best of the best to come to optometry if we show them why it's an amazing profession. You're gonna change people's lives every day. You're gonna walk out making a nice living, a six-figure salary when you walk out. You're gonna be able to to, to have a great work-life balance. I mean, these are things that we should be able to recruit the best of the best students of color, black and brown students, to show them why optometry is a great path and show why optometry is gonna lead the way as it relates to really changing and changing substantially. Today, on average, we have between three and 5% of our student body in optometry school are, are black and brown people. That is not representative of our communities. That is not enough. We have to do a better job. And I respect what the NOA has done for many, many years, but we have to help the NOA. They can't do it by themselves. The NOA needs everybody's help. Each individual can make a difference and can actually make optometry be the standard by which everyone looks at to see how do you do it. We have the capabilities of doing it. We have wonderful people like Sherry Ann and Danielle and Coco and Breezy and Cheryl and all of you have taken the time to be on this call. We need every single person to talk about optometry, to get us to be more diverse. If we can do that, we'll go a long way to solving many of the issues that I'm hearing here. Of course, my mindset comes from that perspective, but I truly believe we must impact at that level. Otherwise, much of what's been talked about here will not be able to be achieved. We're ready to do it. ASCO is ready to do it. The schools and colleges are ready to do it, but we need all of you and we need your support. And I hope we can count on that. Can you share a little bit about what um, are some of the initiatives or what are some of the ways you guys plan to um, increase diversity in the school? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's the recruitment side. We have an amazing admissions group. And to be honest, they haven't always been as comfortable going to historic black colleges and universities. We haven't had great role models. For me to stand up in front of a, a historic black college or university and say optometry is a fantastic program, which I have no uh, qualms about doing, it's not the same as if Cheryl gets up there or if Sherry Ann gets up there or someone can get up there who they can relate to. So we are upping our recruitment process. We have created a position for diversity and inclusion. We think this is a critical component to not only make a statement for the college, but also to have someone who focuses their time and effort purely on that initiative. And that would be for hiring of staff, of faculty, and for recruitment of students. And also candidly to get our own house in order. I think we all have to be a little careful about getting out there aggressively, which we need to do, and not first making sure we have created a welcoming environment. We surveyed at, at New England College of Optometry, our students, our staff, and our faculty, and candidly found information that was troubling. We thought we had a pretty good environment. We are very diverse in terms of our student body in many ways, but we have gaps. This profession has gaps, and those gaps are people of color. So one is creating a, a greater engagement as it relates to admission. Secondly is creating a position that we will have, and this we have an applicant for that position right now that we really like, so we're excited about it. An optometrist who's a person of color, we hope. That's how we'd like to see this move forward. Um, we have a problem at the college too. We're 125 years old, and we have pictures of old stodgy white men all over our building. And you know what? They are our history. They are how New England College of Optometry got to where we are. But I will tell you over and over again, I hear comments from students coming in saying, what is the deal with all these old white guys? Has anybody ever contributed to this institution that looks any different than you do? And that is a big initiative for us to make sure 
that we are doing those things. We are gonna hold events at the college for open dialogue about what's going on at the college. We have made statements, I've made these statements very publicly, that we will not and cannot accept any level of racism, discrimination, or harassment. We have put that stake in the ground. We will not tolerate that. We have set up guidelines around it. We have set up criteria for what we want to achieve. So those are among, we have 10 steps that we are looking at right now to try to create a better environment at New England College. The students are rallying around it. They're excited about it. But I have two faculty members that are people of color. And I'm not gonna have any more faculty members who are people of color unless the schools and colleges do a better job of recruiting, and we need all of your help to do that. So Danielle, I just want to add to what Dr. Purcell said as president of the NLA. So all of us here, most of us African-American optometrists, black optometrists, stand on the shoulders of giants that have come before us. Dr. C. Clayton Powell and Dr. Uh, 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 that. And they led that charge. And again, it starts at the school and the NOA needs all the help that they can get. Together, united we stand, divided we fall. And I say this to say that we're all in this together. So just to touch on what Dr. Purcell said, Blacks make up 13.4% of the population. We have approximately 1.8% of students in optometry school. That is sad. 50 years later, 1.8% of, uh, I'm sorry, practicing optometrists, and then 2.7% of students. Hispanics make up 15.9% of our population, and of course their numbers, 3.9 practicing ODs, 11.6, so there's been some needle moved on getting more Hispanic in our schools and colleges. Asian makes up 6.0% of our population, and they make up 13.7% of practicing ODs and 30.9% of students of optometrists. So you can see right there, the lowest numbers consistently has been African-American students. So again, it starts off with mentorship. So the NOA has partnered with uh, Marvin Poston, the first black from Berkeley who helped form BSP family is very passionate about this. And so we're partnering together the NOA and the Poston family and VSP to target HBCUs. It starts as Dr. Purcell with mentorship. That is so critically important. Increasing awareness about eye care, about the profession that we love to students in historically black uh, schools and colleges. A lot of the recruitment, unfortunately, that schools and colleges do, do not target HBCUs. They target the school I went to, University of Florida. That's just a fact. They do not target HBCUs. So when schools say they cannot find talented, smart African Americans, I don't know where they're looking because they're there. So that's a goal, an initiative of ours that we're rolling out. I was fortunate when you talk about allies uh, to partner and be on the committee when we did our Optometry Give Me Life campaign with ASCO. And one of the mission of that Optometry Give Me Life campaign was to make sure there was diverse groups of students talking about their, uh, per this profession. And, and even when working with NEHAP and in uh, redoing their glaucoma toolkit and their diabetes toolkit years ago, the NOA had that opportunity and we had the conversation again about the imagery. You cannot have imagery about glaucoma that's disproportionately Caucasian. It really doesn't underscore the importance of this disease in the endurance population. So that's something we've worked with when we said allyship, working with our you know, prevent blindness, NEHAP, our corporate partners, um, you know, the schools. I, I currently am working with uh, the ASCO Diversity SIG and partnering with what's going right now. Our students are hurting. You know, I've, I've been on the NOSA call, I've heard the complaints. They may not complain to their school administrator, but they're really upset at this point. And so this is a time that we really have to be re-engaged and we really have to hear their pleas. You know, they're not being heard. And when we talk about what Sherry Ann said, you swallow it and you take it. It's a mental thing. It really does break you down mentally uh, when you see that. So I think for us as optometrists here, one of the biggest things that I'm a proponent of is mentorship. Dr. Terrence Ingraham has been one of my awesome mentors. He's a phenomenal person. I'm at the school in, uh, at Nova because of him and his recruitment of me. Dr. C. Clayton Powell, who's still alive today at 94 Young, um, has been one of my biggest mentors. And he's really, really... Uh, 
encouraged me to continue this fight on behalf of the NOA to make sure that the next generation of bright, talented young optometrists uh, gets into the schools and colleges of optometry. So I am challenged and tasked with holding ASCO's feet to the fire. It is not good or right to change the definition of underserved minority to fit one category of individuals and not fit all. And it's not right to have a school or colleges of optometry you know, focus on African Americans. It's not right to be the only one. 50, 60 years later, you're the only one in your class. That shouldn't be happening. So it starts with mentorship. It starts with partnering with, uh, with the groups ASCO the schools and colleges. And as Dr. Purcell said before, holding them to accountability. What are they doing to increase diversity? You know, like, as you said, Danielle, at one point, George Floyd's death has really led to this conversation, but the NOA has never not been part of this conversation. We have been here. Many of the students that are now doctors have been part of NOSA. Some have not, I understand, but NOSA, we're just, we're going to have our award ceremony. We give out approximately $50,000 in scholarship to deserving minority students. Our NOSA chapter is very diverse. The NOA is diverse. I mean, the NOA started this fight, not just for African American or Black, uh, Hispanics, we've had Hispanic presidents. Uh, we, uh, we want all inclusiveness. It's just this argument about, oh, you're a black organization. I don't think we have to make excuses for who we are as an organization. We need to be part of the discussion and part of the fight to uh, continue with diversity, inclusion, and more importantly, equ equality. It's not good enough for me to go to a conference and there's no one that looks like me speaking. Um, you know, when you go to these conferences, it's very rare to see an African-American speaking or lecturing. It's very rare sometimes to see them in the uh, sponsorship hall. Coco and Breezy, I, I hear you, I see you, but I haven't met you personally yet. I haven't seen you at a conference. I'm hoping to see a Vision Expo West, but it's sometimes rare to see African-American companies um, in, in, in the sphere. And so it's a challenge for all of us. And I think this uncomfortable conversation that you're doing right now is a very necessary and a very needed conversation to move that needle forward. So the NOA is still here. And we're going to have our award ceremony, encourage our students. We're giving out approximately $50,000. We want to thank all of our corporate partners from Allergan, Johnson Johnson, Hoya, who have supported us. And we're going to hold them to accountability as well. And so Dr. Reynolds, how can people be in support of the NOA? Well, I would, uh, for example, uh, we have a National Optometric Foundation, which is our philanthropic arms. If you wanted to support us uh, as far as support our scholarship initiative and our community outreach, we have our National Optometric Foundation. We have our Three Silent Killers Initiative, uh, focused on diabetes, high blood pressure, and glaucoma, and minority population. If you wanted pamphlets for your patients that are of um, you know, minority descent or minorities, you can have those pamphlets. We're currently working with Prevent Blindness on our children's initiative and with blackdoctors.org uh, with that. We want you to know that the NOA is here and that we're out there. We have our website, we have our site line. I just gave a commencement speech to uh, Southern California College of Optometry at Marshall B. Ketchum and it was a beautiful experience. And I think it's just continuing the fight to let us know, let you guys all know that optometry, especially diversity in optometry is just an important fight for the NOA to continue. And as Dr. Purcell, we were the leaders in that and uh, we continue to try to be the leaders in that and hold the schools accountable. And if Danielle, want... if I might, and I, I apologize very quickly. First of all, I couldn't be any more proud of Cheryl. I got to say what she has done and how she has really been in such an advocate, number one. Number two, if I could quickly say, because I think we have some industry people on this call, mm -hmm. think about scholarships. The NOA has done a wonderful job of it. If we could walk into a historic black college uh, or university and offer a four-year scholarship to optometry school, this would really help stimulate some momentum. So Forgive me for jumping in, but I, I know we have a great audience here who are very generous people. And I would love to see, you know, it's, it's $160,000 a year for tuition for a big corporate organization to support four or five students coming through to get it started, to get some momentum going. I think would be a wonderful way to go. So I didn't mean to put in a plug yeah, there, but I think appropriate no, I think for the audience here. That's as far as <laughs> and, and to touch on the industry uh, opinion, Sherry, and I would love to have you sort of go next and share what allyship or support looks like from your view. 
Sure. And so I think because Howard and Cheryl have focused so much on the pipeline of talent, I want to focus on the inclusion part of inclusion and diversity. Um, I think for a while, corporate America has gotten that you, you need to diversify from a pragmatic reason to represent your customer base. Um, clearly, from what was said, there's significant opportunity. Where I think there's still tremendous room for growth is to create an environment that allows people to feel safe and thrive. Um, a, a lot of times people um, of color and, and minorities come into a corporate environment and, and they're shell-shocked. And because of unconscious biases, they're received a certain way. And some people become very good at, I'll introduce another term, um, code switching, and they're able to figure out how to thrive. Um, others cannot. So I think the mentoring is a good place to start, but I really think having that uh, unconscious bias training to let people recognize that they project their own feelings onto certain behaviors. So they project, um, this person's really angry, this person's really pushy. These, all these um, emotions are attributed to people that prevent them from progressing in their career, prevent therefore from you having leaders at the top, and, and, and it just, the cycle perpetuates. So I'm really proud of Essilor because that is an area that the company has worked really hard in to not only um, have a, a commitment to diversity, but to really make a concerted effort with business resource groups to listen to the employees, to provide resources for them, for them to be successful. And, and I want to give a, a shout out to my alma mater transitions. Um, it's part of the Essilor family. But, but when I was there um, and I headed up their marketing team, it was actually built before me. I just had the benefit of, of being able to leverage it. There was a, a, a multicultural marketing initiative that was built to support independent optometry. So there was a recognition that so many independent um, optometrists don't know how to market to the patient base and how could we provide them the tools and the resources, whether it's something as fundamental as a multi-language um, pamphlet or as Coco and Breezy have talked really passionate about, just having assets that represent um, the patient base. And these assets were created by a corporation transitions to serve their, their customer base, to make them better serve their customer base and to come full circle, forgetting just doing this because it's the right thing to do. It was by far one of the most um, effective marketing vehicles we had in terms of return on investment, because when you make people feel like they matter and you talk to them in their voice, they're gonna show up for you, which is why minorities are some of the most loyal customers. So it was a, a, the right thing to do. It was a smart business move. And these are just two of the ways I think that corporations can really make a commitment to being an ally. And it always ultimately ends up, just like when you do any good in life, you end up being better for it. It ends up being better for the corporation. Absolutely. I just want to add real quick, Danielle, I want to uh, segue to what uh, Shireen said. The NOA partnered with Transition to do three panel events with that multicultural toolkit. It was one of our most successful panel events, well attended, and really it was just a good alignment or allyship between us and Transition. So we're hoping to do that again in the future um, with Essilor, just to have more panel events um, for our, our, our doctors. And so thank you. I just wanted to bring that up. I have a really good point to make about allyship, and I kind of want to flip the script a little bit. You know, I love to flip the script, and <laughs> I, I get nervous. We're, we're right on time, as we're about to flip the script. Okay, I, I get ner so nervous. Reason makes me nervous, but it's okay. And Terrence knows this about me, but I would love to flip the script, because again, we're here um, because we love you guys, but something that I would love to see is that I would love to see at like a Vision Expo or like positions like this, where we as Black people are not teaching you how to be an ally, but I would love, I'm not sure we can do this, Terrence, but I feel like Howard- well, anything, anything you want, Breezy. Okay, I feel like Howard killed it. He's like a really good example of an ally, but I would love, maybe mm -hmm. Howard can host it and maybe maybe like four people in here can be on top of the panel and they can actually come up with a plan and tell us and, and everybody else who wants to be allies. Mm -hmm. Tell everyone can talk amongst each other what allyship looks like. So I think a good thing is that there are a lot of conversations that Black people are having right. where we're we're speaking amongst each other in the Black community about how we're going to make change, 
how we're going to shift the needle. But then we're and, also... And before that, we had to talk about how we had to simulate to fit in an industry that wasn't for us. And then I think that we're also in the position where we're on the panels teaching you all, but I would love to be like in the audience hearing you all talk about the plans and how you're going to check somebody for saying a racial slur, how you're going to fire somebody for not taking a black patient. I would, what, I would eat that up. I would love, I would love to see a panel like that at Vision Expo. Maybe we can start it on Zoom. I would love to see that with, um, I would just love to see more of that. So that's how I think good allyship is, is working is that we're all doing our parts, but we also have our, our allies having those conversations amongst each other with a, a plan and an action as well. And, and, and Coco, to, to build on that, let, let's aim high. Let's, let's not get to the, just the basic definitions of racism, like firing somebody because- Oh they, no, I'm, I'm just being petty right now. No, no, no <laughs> but, but, but I'm saying I, I want the audience to realize that there's something much more fundamental is that you just need to create an atmosphere where people can thrive and be themselves and feel included and grow and, and have the same abilities as everyone else. That is all people are asking for. If I go in and I work as hard as you and I go to school and I put in the work and I design great glasses, I just want a chance to be successful without having to do what all of us say. Well, we know we're gonna have to work twice as hard and do twice as much. Every person of color on this panel, I guarantee you, they've told that to their children. You have to work twice as hard and do twice as much to get half as much. That, that's all, that, that's what I want corporations to move from. We are not going to tolerate someone being racist to saying, I'm going to create a, an atmosphere that represents what this country is about, that everybody has an equal chance to be successful. You know, I've heard so many times this thing about what you guys tell your kids. And I think it'd be interesting to also ask people like me what I'm telling my kids. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, and we don't hear that very often. And I think it's important. And by the way, I'll just add to Coco and Breezy, anything you guys ask me to do, I'm going to do because I think you guys are awesome, first Ooh, of all. But I would use if, that. Well, within reason, within <laughs> reason. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I will say if Terrence and Danielle and Ashley and the people at the Vision Council, I see other leaders of the Vision Council on here. If that's something you guys want to do, sign me up. I'm ready to do it tomorrow, anytime you're ready. I think that's a great idea. I'm sorry to cut into this conversation. I'm not a panelist. Uh, but there's so many amazing allies in this industry. I know there's uh, Julie Gagusha who's on, an independent optical owner. Uh, who's been closed for three months and she's in the uh, LA area and she's taking amazing steps to continue to show her allyship. Uh, even closing her store and giving her employees paid time off for Juneteenth uh, this year. This is stuff that even the big corporations in our industry are not doing. So I yeah. think that idea, Breezy, that's an amazing idea. Um, and also just to feed off and finish our portion of the allyship, I also think it's important that if you are in eye care practice or if you are a publication, even though that, even though, um, you know, you might have brands only sending you imagery that might be non, that might only be like non-Black people, even if you are in optical practice and you realize that, oh my gosh, all the brands I'm carrying are only white-owned companies. I don't have any Black-owned companies in my location. And you might say, like, I had a conversation with a friend of ours who's in the industry and she's an ally and she's a friend of mine, but I told her she's still part of the problem. And the reason why she's part of the problem is because she has, she says her, her practice is high-end designer, limited edition, and our product is too mass market for her. So I said, so you can't break the rules to bring in a black owned company because we make luxury glasses at an accessible price point because we know that all of our people can't afford our beautiful glasses, but we want everyone to style. So sometimes you have to break the rules, like break your regular rules to add inclusion. Don't get too stuck on what you're used to because we've been, we've been navigating like this and I'm done navigating like this, you know? And, and so, another thing too, a lot of people make the excuse and they say, well, I only have white customers. I only need, I need white marketing. The reason why you only have white customers is because you're not showing black or brown faces. You feel me? So that's another issue. So that's not an excuse anymore. I only have white readers. It's because you're not showing and representing us. I'm tired and, of- and, and honestly, uh, you know, I can say as someone who does marketing for I, everything, because I was, 
so many times we represent the culture, we're at the forefront of the culture. I, I did not um, want you guys to be a part of Transitions because you were there to attract black customers. It was your look, your edginess, your representation of youth. It, it, the fact that you happen to be black was part of it. So, yeah. so let's expand our horizons. We, exactly. we are actually on the forefront of popular culture and, and that's that's why you should be leveraged in advertising. Yeah, exactly. and we, and we love, tra Transitions is our favorite partnership. Yeah. Like, cause they always allowed us to be ourselves. And I, I can say that I'm very grateful for that because working with such a huge partner like that, they could have easily had us assimilate, but they 100% gave us all the freedom to be our true selves. And I think more people need to take that on as well. It's important because I, I have to say within music, fashion, art, it's all stemmed from black culture. It's, it's been stolen from us, it's been snatched from us. And all the music you love, the style, the hairstyle, the TikTok dances you do, that came from black culture, but people don't want to see a black person doing it. You, you think just, Howard's doing TikTok dancing? <laughs> I think he's not. He needs to. He needs to. <laughs> yeah, but, but something that we're excited about everybody is that we're using our platform to speak out about all these issues. And I think that Again, it's not our job to educate people. And I'm so happy I have time today. I actually meditated before this just to make sure I had anxiety before this call because I'm exhausted. And um, I'm excited, but just know anyone that's in this room, me and Breezy have a, a big platform. We're ready to use it if people aren't making shift and change. And we're really, we're ready and to, in the fashion industry, people are getting canceled and their businesses are shutting down. If they're not. And I would gladly love to be a part of shutting down people who aren't gonna get with the program. I mean, that's, it's truly the climate we are in. I, I, um, so I'm based in Los Angeles and uh, the store where I work um, was actually a main thoroughfare for uh, the first weekend of protesting when there was a lot of rioting and looting. And one of my boss's stores was actually looted. There was a police car on fire down the block. We had to close early, cancel all the patients, full stop revolution right outside of the door, right? So in that moment, I think this is a really clear example of allyship. My boss and um, his daughter, who I work really closely with, are both white people, right? The people who are looting the store and how they feel about the Black Lives Matter movement, how they feel about Black people, all of those emotions kind of go into how they choose to respond to that situation. And how they chose to respond was to use their platform and to use their voices to not focus on the byproduct or the symptom, which is looting or rioting or destruction of physical property, but to redirect and bring the conversation back to police brutality and institutionalized white supremacy. So when we talk about like fundamentally what allyship, allyship is bringing the conversation to what's important and showing up for that conversation. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's uncomfortable. But to Coco and Breezy's earlier point, right, we all have these digital platforms. We all have real estate, both online and in real life. And right now in this moment, it is requiring you to use this real estate in support of anti-racism and creating a more equitable and just society. So what are things you can do? Number one, you can make it clear what your beliefs are. You can make it clear who you support. You can make it clear who is welcome in your spaces. Additionally, you can seek out community of people of other allies to share ideas similar to what, um, to what Breezy was saying earlier. We, you can share ideas and come together within yourselves and your own community and figure out how to make change. One of the things when we talk about allyship, a lot of times people feel like they have to think, you know, so far out of the box and support all these national movements. But I guarantee you there are problems in your current city, in your current workplace, in your current optometry school. There are things happening right where you are. And so you can be active and start, um, and start showing up right now. Danielle, I'm so sorry that I have to go because I yeah, have another commitment. I just want to thank you for mm -hmm. including me in this panel. Mm -hmm. and I look forward to the one that apparently we're going to be doing live somewhere. So, um, I, <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Thank all of you guys for, for being on this panel and thank you for being so candid and honest and sharing your experiences. And I hope this conversation is the first of many that can lead to true diversity and inclusion within this industry. All right, thank you all for having me as well. Danielle, you did an amazing job. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, Danielle, I think you're a prime example of a black.
black female optometrist in this industry uh, that I don't understand why there's not more visibility or spotlight on you. But I think you hosting this panel, what you do in your profession, what you do at Vision Expo, this panel just speaks to uh, why the industry needs to recognize more black female optometrists. So thank you for the way you did that. I've seen many coffee talks, but I've been in chills with this one this entire time. So you, you conducted this coffee talk like a symphony. So thank you for that. Uh, Howard, really appreciate that and being here. Someone texted me and said, you're right, he really is a true ally. So I think you <laughs> Well, that's, I, 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 that's, I, one of the, that's one of the best compliments I can get, to be honest. I appreciate it very much. And I've been honored to be a part of this group. Uh, Coco and Breezy mentioned that they were meditating before they came on. I have to be honest, I was a little nervous about coming on here too. I'm not the same color as everybody else on the panel, but I did try to do my best to give you my perspective. And I tell you, we are committed. We as a college are committed. We as a profession are committed. We're going to make a difference. We're going to be the model by which other people look at. And Howard, I can say thank you so much for being so vulnerable because mm -hmm. we do need allies like you because I think that when non-Black people hear us speaking, we sound like we're complaining all the time. This mm -hmm. has been a conversation we've talked about for 400 years. And so we have a lot of people say, you always complain about being Black. So if we can get, if people can hear it from someone that looks like them, because as we see in America, people are conditioned to listen, to listen to people that look like them. If we can have more allies that no more Karens or Kevins. We want some Howards in this. <laughs> like, be a Howard. Don't be a Kevin or Karen. All right. That's very nice. And I will say this. I'll say this. I will work with you guys to do everything possible. I want you guys to come with me on a couple of recruitment trips and show people why this channel, this profession is incredible. And there are people out there that are edgy, that are changing it. I want you guys right next to me for that. Down, we're down. I just want to say on behalf of the NOA, thank you so much for having us again. We have always been here. The NOA, uh, Danielle, we love you. You've uh, been one of my star students, and I just love you for that, Terrence. Thank you so much for partnering with this. I'm so oh, proud to be part of this conversation. I think I look forward to being part of more of these conversations and moving the needle forward um, on diversity. I have to tell you, more committed after my statement went out and the NOA received some racist response that our organization is impactful. We've been here more than 50 years and we will continue to be here 50 years and beyond. And making sure that the next generation of optometrists that uh, looks like me and you and that are diverse are still there. So we're standing strong. So thank you so much for having no. me. And I have, one, I have more, one more funny thing is that um, Danielle, um, Cheryl, anyone else in this room, if you guys do get any racist comments from anyone, Send them to us, we're having and, everybody, and I will. I'm so happy to yeah, let everyone know. We're having everyone send us their like racist um situations. Well, I'll send it to you. Their optical shops, and we're use our platform to call them out, and you'll be anonymous. Yeah. Yeah, you and go. you know, in, interestingly, interestingly, it was an optometrist. Oh, send it our way, and please send it. Your name on business, we will gladly put it on blast. <laughs> I just want to say also, Dr. Reynolds, why I have you, if uh, there's a lot of people in here, company heads, there's people in our trade media, if you have not attended the NOA convention, Thank you. that's something you definitely need to be supporting financially, you need to be supporting with bodies. Uh, Howard, I always see you there. Uh, uh, thank you. But if you are not supporting the NOA convention, you need to really look at your diversity and inclusion platform because this, is the, this industry has been around for 50 years, not 70 or 80 years, where it was, segregation was everywhere. This is only 1969. So we would see this, is, we have a, still a far way to go. So thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for being here. Uh, Kobo and Breezy. Can, can I say one more thing that's really nice is that anyone Absolutely. that's in this room, if you ever have any questions, if you're afraid to bring up a conversation with a black person, it's okay to feel like you might say something wrong. Just start off and say, hey, I have a question. I, it might be mm -hmm. right or wrong, but can I ask you this? Because I think that sometimes people are silent because don't they don't know what to say and they're afraid to say it wrong. It's okay, be uncomfortable and just say the, dis dis the disclaimer ahead of time and say, I might say this wrong, but I'm coming from a genuine place. Here's the question. I think also what I always say, Coco Breezy, if you're uncomfortable with these conversations, if you're uncomfortable with anything anyone said on this call today, it's then good. you need to have more conversations like that because you need to have the conversation until it becomes comfortable, you know? Yeah. You know, so you need to not just keep, keep silent, you need to have the uncomfortable conversation if it is for you. And if you are uncomfortable, then that's a great sign. The way I have been sort of telling my friends, you know, or people in my sphere of influence is 
it's similar to like learning to walk, right? Kids are like stumbling around, they're falling, they're like getting back up and trying again. So similarly, joining the fight for racial justice, joining the movement for true social equity. If you have been sitting on the sidelines, it may feel uncomfortable or may feel like it's not your fight, but now that you know it is, to um, Coco's point, it's okay to be uncomfortable and it's okay to say the wrong thing. No one's going to hold your you hold you to that because fundamentally it's the intention, right? And like Dr. Reynolds said, united we stand, divided we fall. So this is really a time where everyone is needed in their own way and in their own role. And that's gonna be your personal work to figure out what that looks like. But yes, educate yourself, have conversations with people who don't look like you, be willing to be uncomfortable, be willing to be vulnerable and just know that ultimately together is how we move forward. Very well. It's a really good way to transition. Um, talking about our commitment and where we stand, I want to make you aware of a campaign we're starting on Open Your Eyes. Uh, the premise of this campaign is we are the industry that gives us world sight. So we cannot be blind when it comes to equals, of in, excuse me, uh, issues of inequality and injustice. So if you think about just what our commitment is, uh, one thing we're doing at the Vision Council this Friday, we are having an Open Your Eyes frame auction. It's going to be virtually. It's going to be going on for an entire week. And we are partnering with independent designers that have been proven allies of the Black community. These are designers that use diversity within their POPs, and th those who have made a very firm stance in the industry. So that link for that virtual uh, frame auction on my Instagram page, at the optical poet, 100% of the proceeds from this frame auction is going to the Equal Justice uh, initiative as well as to my brother's keeper alliance so go ahead and check out my uh, instagram page at the optical poet and there'll be a link there check out the mail shout out to you marge yesterday they have released a press release on this auction and we invite everyone to come by friday 6 p.m it is a happy hour so bring your adult beverage of choice as well and we are going to raise money for a great cause uh, to two different causes about the justice as well as the educational system. I want to thank everybody for being on. Thank you for taking time out of your day for being here. Um, this, this panel was a favorite to the industry. Uh, it really was. Uh, these people didn't have to share their stories, so they go through, uh, but we're happy that you did and hopefully to push to a more equitable agenda. So I am signing off. I want to thank you all. So you know about Coffee Talk. We're officially signing off, but we also have the Coffee Talk after party happens afterwards. So please stick around for that if you want to continue this conversation. But we are officially signing off. Take care, guys. Thank you for supporting. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Danielle. Job. Amazing. Great job. Great job. Really nice job. Man, that was great. And I love the idea of Coco and Breezy. About Amazing panel. idea. Um, I totally nice. agree. I would love to hear. I agree. Like the, the work of creating the solutions is not really our job anymore. <laughs> so I would love to have someone else kind of pass the baton off, right? You take the baton. Now you can create the solution and yeah. present them yeah. to your own, you know, to your say, Danielle, in the climate that we're in, where it's very racially charged right now, I know you say it's not our job, but it still is our job because- 100%. Yeah. I think, I, I think it no, is. It's finally our job because uh, talking to the students, you know, one of the challenge with the NOSA students Students, which are disproportionately African American Blacks, you know, it's a kaleidoscope of different people. But talking to them, most of them were Black. And I, I my conversation is have that conversation because they, some of them, like uh, Coco and Breezy said, they're so afraid to even approach you. Like they feel at this moment, if they say something, you might. Rrr. So I think it's. No, I mean, it's our job to be in partnership, but yeah, again, right, black, to, to a point someone made earlier, black people cannot have this conversation with white people. This is an intra community mm -hmm. conversation. Right, exactly. That we have. So yeah. it's not our, I don't feel like it's our job to facilitate an intra community discussion. It's our mm -hmm. job to educate and provide resources and support to help form, you know, true opinions and, and, in action items, but that is work that I think is now time to the creating what that looks like in, in real time in community work. And I think the same way that we're doing this panel in the same way for the past 50 to 400 years, we've been doing panels where we're on the panel and we as black people are discussing diversity. Now I'm ready to see the other side have panels and we are in the audience 
And we hear people going back and forth and what they need to do. We don't see that. Mm -hmm. But that's what no, we see. It's not only our job. I cannot wait until now we can see how everyone else is discussing. And we want to, I want to learn. Yeah. I think also with another job, uh, i give you an example. A friend of mine in the industry texted me. He's like, I I I'm subscribed to a black book company who are sending me ally books and resources each month. So he's taking the initiative to educate himself as well. He's, he's the same way I can Google uh, anything. I can Google black owned businesses. I can Google black um, resources for allyship. So I think it's very important for people who aren't black, white people in this industry to really realize that they have a responsibility also to look at those resources if they truly want to become allies. Can I tell everyone to Google, um, there's like a really cool YouTube video about systemic racism. Cause there might be some people who still aren't necessarily who are allies, but I think that it's important to even educate yourself on the deepness and the history of systemic racism. Because even a, a quick story, and it has something to do with eyewear, but it just has something to do with black history. We don't get taught black history for a reason. It's because people, right. don't wanna, people in history and in America, they don't want you to know about the positivity about black history and, and, a black, and about like black people doing well. So back in the day, I forget, don't don't quote me on the dates, but in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, there was 35 blacks of black businesses. They called it Black Wall Street. In the 19th century, that um, that we don't learn in high school or in school because they don't want you to know. But 35 blocks that got burnt down. So when people are talking about, oh, black people are burning shit, white people have been burning our shit. So back in the day. They burned down 35 businesses. There were white people that were very envious of black people that had better houses, better businesses, more and they, money. There were banks, doctor's offices, grocery stores, and everything. Airports. That's and the celebration, Coco and Breezy, of June 19th. So on June 19th is when they, more than 35, they actually burnt down a lot of people in that town and burnt down all of the businesses in that town uh, mm -hmm. because a uh, black man supposedly looked at a white woman wrong. But the point, uh, what you just said is what I just wanted to underscore. That's why, Danielle, I said it is our job because my son brought this up. He's mm -hmm. 17. They don't teach me black history. So when the protest started, he looked, he, he, I think the YouTube channel that Coco and Breezy said, and he came out of his room and was like, now I understand black history. They don't talk me, teach me black history. And then he goes through all this stuff. And then he's like, mom, that's why I'm so angry. I'm so angry. So little baby song is playing every minute. And he, now he understands because they're right. They don't teach it in school. So if they're not teaching it in school, a lot of these, you know, again, what I say to the NOSA students who are having this long, big conversation, and we're going to have a town hall. So we're having another town hall meeting with these, this group is that, uh, you, you, you may have to have those uncomfortable conversation with them because they don't realize what they're doing, what they're saying. Don't be afraid anymore. You have to speak up and speak out. We're holding our dean, our college dean didn't even send out a letter of support. I sent out the letter because I'm the president and the students are so pissed off with our dean. And so now we're trying to write a delicate letter so he understands, well, no delicacy, you just gotta write a letter. You know what I'm saying? So I think speaking up and speaking out is where it's important in educating um, our colleagues because a lot of them simply they don't know the and I, I mean one thing I will say when we talk about education there are literally there are so many um, nonprofits who actually do the work of creating anti-racism uh, education to to also talking about systemic white supremacy defining it studying it in an academic context providing solutions so um, I think we can help educate, but also there are people who do this work professionally and we can bring some of those resources into, into those conversations so that we aren't the ones doing all of the emotional labor because there actually is labor and work being done already. We can just help kind of shed light on that and amplify it. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you again for having me. Thanks guys, oh, it was a blast. Definitely. Thank you for being so honest and open to the attendees. Thank you for showing up. Thanks for having open hearts and minds. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to add this link really fast. One second. Hold on. So everybody can check it out. We're dropping the link in the comments. Okay. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was great. Thanks, Coco and Breezy. Appreciate it. We'll see you guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Until Bye. next time, be safe.
Definitely. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.